Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Allen, Chris Smith, and Mark Gibson. Coming up, coming up on DTNS, Aptera buys a factory for their solar car. Dan Campos tells us about a proposed standard for space-time. And Amazon, Wing, and Elroy are all expanding drone delivery. Is this about to become real? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 15th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, what a better way to wrap up a week than to hang out and talk tech news with my friends here. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Nikkei Asia sources say that Intel informed customers it will raise prices on most of its chip products later this year, citing rising costs. Increases will vary based on specific chips from single-digit increases up to 20% in other cases. So... No more chip shortage. <laughs> so, so if lying. you can pay for them, you can have them. Uh, Protocol has a good article up for those wanting to understand the impact of these Chapter 11 bankruptcies that have been happening in the cryptocurrency space. There's a lot of them. Uh, two of the bigger ones are from Voyager Digital, uh, which was announced on July 6th, and Celsius on July 13th. The protocol article does a great job of explaining why these are precedent setting for how cryptocurrency bankruptcies will be handled. Government regulators vary on whether to treat cryptocurrency as money, as currency, or as a commodity. Uh, they sometimes classify it differently for one regulation like tax than they do for another. So if it's currency, the company has to give you the value at the time you transacted with them if they're doing bankruptcy. Whereas if it's a commodity, the value is based on the current market value. And those are going to be different values. Not to mention what priority you as a customer of an exchange has as a creditor is a question. This is well settled for traditional banks, but not for cryptocurrency companies. Uh, there have been several smaller lawsuits, but Celsius and Voyager in particular are probably going to set the tone here. Meta announced its image generation engine called Make a Scene, similar to Dolly, which we've talked about on previous episodes, Crayon, Imogen. Make a Scene differs, though, in letting the user contribute a sketch as part of the prompt. So you could say something like a bear eating a taco. And if you wanted to sketch quickly where you want the bear, where you want the taco, give it a little something, something at the beginning. And That's the system cool. has been made available to artists who work with AI, including Sophia Crespo, Scott Eaton, Alexander Rebin, and Refik Anadol, who are all going to give public feedback. Meta doesn't have plans to make it public just yet. They might in the future. But in related meta news, Facebook began testing a way to let users create up to five profiles linked to a single account. These profiles could be dedicated to maybe a hobby that you have, certain friend groups that you have, a business. It's like a Finsta, but for Facebook. These profiles cannot mispresent a user's identity, however. Oh, so I can't create a Sarah Lane profile. I mean, if you did, you would be misrepresenting me. Exactly. And yourself. <laughs> and myself. Uh, CDs are back, folks, in so many ways, including now the ability to rip CDs returning to Windows Media Player. Uh, you may recall Windows enabled CD playback in WMP in March, and CD ripping is rolling out to the latest preview version right now. WMP will be able to rip to AAC, FLAC, and ALC, but not MP3. So get out that new ESPA CD and make some FLAX. Yeah. The Wall Street Journal sources say that Amazon began significantly reducing the number of items it sells under its own private labels and even discussed exiting the private label business entirely. This reduction comes in part from disappointing sales of those products, but also to avoid further regulatory scrutiny, which Amazon has had a lot of. As of 2020, Amazon had 243,000 products across 45 different private brands. All right. We got uh, we got some interesting EV car news uh, rolling along these days. You remember us telling you about Aptera. Aptera makes a three-wheeled electric vehicle with a solar panel on top. We talked about the solar panel before. There's some speculation about how useful that solar panel actually is, but they claim it'll get you between 16 and 40 miles of extra charge a day, depending on your battery pack and, of course, how much exposure to the sun it has. The car itself has a range of 250 miles on the base battery, though it 
it offers a larger battery pack that it says can give you a thousand mile range. They're talking about a hundred kilowatt hour battery there. Uh, it offers options to put solar panels on the hood and the hatch, uh, in addition to the one that comes on top and drag coefficient, which is becoming increasingly popular to mention with EVs because less drag means more range. Uh, the Aptera claims to have a pretty good one, 0.13 drag coefficient. By comparison, the Tesla Model 3 has a 0.23, and the Ionic 6 that we talked about yesterday claims 0.21. The Aptera goes 0 to 60 in three and a half seconds. They also want you to know that for some reason, these car makers really want you to think that you can live in these cars. Hyundai showed off a lot of use cases for working while parking this Ionic 6 um, that you guys talked about on yesterday's show. And Aptera showed off a camping configuration that turns the trunk into a pop-up tent. After its pitch is the solar panel can charge the devices. Now, some folks have pre-ordered the Aptera uh, more than a year and a half ago, and the company had to push back delivery dates. But since then, the news is Aptera bought a factory in Carlsbad, California to scale up production. So it has partnered with Michigan's Red Viking to use automated guide vehicles, a.k.a. AGVs, a.k.a. robots, to move heavy parts around the factory floor. It says it can reach 10,000 cars out of that factory by the end of the year. It has 25,000 orders to fill, though. Uh, and you only need a hundred dollar deposit, so maybe some of those twenty five thousand orders will will drop out once they face the price. Although the price of the Aptra is not that high relative to other EVs out there, you can reserve an Aptra US with a twenty five thousand nine hundred dollar price. However, if you want that big old battery that I mentioned earlier, the price goes up to forty six thousand nine hundred dollars. And if you want all the extra options like the extra solar panels on the hood and everything, it tops out at fifty thousand seven hundred. But but going back to that 25.9K uh, price, that that's starting to get close to that 25K mark that we were talking about not too long ago. Yeah, so one of the things that I'm wondering, um, the fact that you only got to put $100 down on this, how many of these are they really going to make? Now, I know that they've got a new factory and everything, but I'm just starting to, to, to really wonder, um, are they going to be able to push out uh, enough of these vehicles to, to be sustainable? Yeah, they have other ways of making them, too. The Carlsbad uh, factory wasn't their only way of making them, so I'm not sure what their full capacity is. Uh, and that $100 deposit cuts both ways, right? You're, you're, you're right. I was looking at it as like, well, a bunch of people might have put $100 down, but then don't follow through. But it also means a lot more people would be willing to get in line pushing up those orders, and then they will uh, follow through. I, I don't know. I love this idea. I don't. It reminds me of the problems with, uh, do you remember the Honda? It was at the Honda Insight that had mm -hmm. the the weird back wheels. It was one of the first hybrids mm -hmm. and the uh, and and the early Prius uh, before they went with the more normal uh, Yaris looking uh, car. They, ha they had a kind of a weird design. Like, I don't know why you have to make your design stand out because I'm not sure I want a three wheel car, but I guess that's part of the efficiency. So, you know. If you want it, this is how you get it. I love the, the what, what got me here was the the sort of camp out of your car component. We <laughs> yeah, we talked we talked a lot about work out of your car component when we were talking about the Ionic Six yesterday, and how yeah, there's a lot of people who are like, well, sometimes I have to, and it's kind of cumbersome, and this could be a lot more comfortable, you know, depending on what you're doing. And I was like, I mean, yeah, sure, a lot of people like to go camping. If you're gonna have your car anyway, why not, you know, make it something not unlike the Volkswagen bus I had when I was a little kid that had a pop top, you know, where, I mean, the, my whole family, which is only three people, but still all three of us weren't going to sleep up there, but somebody could, that was cool. You know, that's also the reason my dad had a pickup, <laughs> put a sleeping bag in the back and Sarah will go to bed and, <laughs> you know, depending on where we were. So there's definitely a need for that. I think, I think a lot of the timing of this feels like a, car companies were trying to get creative anyway. Yeah. And a lot of people during the pandemic were like, let's get out of Dodge. Let's figure out a way to be a little mm. bit more mobile and to have more options. And so we're now seeing some of the results of that, whether or not to your point, Rob, it's going to sell a lot of vehicles remains to be seen. Yeah, I think the tent 
um, in the trunk is a little bit more gimmicky. All the stuff that they're doing in the, the Ionic, that actually kind of makes sense. If you work out of your car or if you're a student that you maybe travel to school and you don't want to have to leave the school, but you kind of want some privacy, you can go sit in your car and actually study, get some work done. Those work surfaces make a lot more sense than one of the big features is that you can turn your car into a tent when yeah. you're camping. Although, although car camping is a thing these days, I've seen a lot more people talking about is, car camping, you know, so maybe they're just trying, I still think you're right that it's a bit of a gimmick, but it may be a smart gimmick of like, Oh, with car camping. Yeah. I'm into that. You know, check it out. Maybe I'll want to get this. It's still, it's still not a cheap car at 25,900. That's where I end up though. Is like, if I, if I'm thinking like, Oh, maybe I'll trade in my 2014 civic and get this uh, for 25,900 isn't ridiculous, especially for, uh, you know, a brand new EV, but then I have to get this weird looking one, but then it's got solar and that makes me excited. I don't know. I just go back and forth. <sighs> we'll see. Anybody wants to uh, buy us one, uh, as a patron, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, we won't turn it down. We'll live with it. Yes, exactly. Well, a few weeks ago, Ikea launched a new service called Creative, Creative with a K, to scan your room and remove the furniture from the picture so that you could use some augmented reality to see what new furniture would look like. And Ikea hopes that you would buy from them. Ikea's Creative presents the results as a 2D picture, which means it doesn't require LiDAR to work because, you know, it's not 3D. Shopify has demoed a similar product it does require LiDAR, but it can keep everything in 3D, so you can keep looking around after you empty the virtual copy of your room and put new stuff in there. Shopify's Rutch Matchmeyer showed it off on Twitter. Uh, so if you have an iPhone or an iPad slider using the LiDAR and Apple's Room Plan API, you can scan a room and then press a reset button to erase the current furniture and go nuts. Shopify's tool is just in the experimental demo phase for now, but gives an idea of what the company's working on in the future. Yeah, this this is cool. The, the creative one is practical and you can actually use it. This this one from Shopify is just a demo, uh, but it's pretty impressive when it wipes everything out, you know, at, at one touch. Uh, I, I do I do find that an impressive demo. It also took the vents off the wall. So I get why it's still a demo and not a shipping product yet, but uh, yeah. you know, hopefully they'll 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 you know get those little tweaks out of the way and and put this available because if, if I'm a furniture seller on Shopify or a real estate agent, I might just want to be able to tap into this uh, somehow and and be able to to show you know be able to quickly be able to remove things from an actual picture of of something I'm showing off. There there's lots of cool use cases for this, and it does show how we're progressing with augmented reality in practical ways. I mean, as a person who uh, is on Craigslist for fun, not even because I'm looking for an apartment right now, but just just to see what's out there in the world, uh, you, I could see where once, yeah, real estate agents, rental agents, anybody who's you know either potentially going to live somewhere or potentially trying to rent out or sell a place that somebody will live in, the, the, all of these, you know, sure, this could be. I have, I'm a homeowner and I'm looking for a new coffee table and I just want to get a sense of, you know, the place that I'm already in. I think that the market for this is huge for people who are trying to uh, understand w how their stuff and, and how stuff that they may buy in the future is going to fit in a potential new space. Oh, I, I definitely would be a consumer of this. I, I, I am very good at measuring and making sure that the furniture that I purchase fits in the room. Mm -hmm. I'm not so good at making sure that it fits um, my exact configuration. I know that the furniture is going to be in there, but it's like, but does it look as good? It's like, mm -hmm. I've got an additional three feet compared to what I saw in the Ikea display. I've got an additional 14 inches, you know, here. Does it still look the same? This, I think, would give me the opportunity to kind of see, you know, this is really what it's going to look like in your room, especially if you can kind of stand there, look around with your, you know, your your, your VR set on. It's like, oh, yeah, that, that's actually going to look really good there. Um, let me go ahead and pick this purchase up. Yep. And uh, Carl's Jr. lover in our Twitch chat, or uh, Hardy's lover, as he would be known on Rob's side of the country, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he pointed out a good thing, a, a good question, which is, uh, where's the data go? Is this going to, because if this works locally on my phone, then I got no problem with it at all. But if it's sending my room data up to a cloud, then I'm going to need to know a little more about privacy policies. Mm, and, that's a good point. And all of that stuff. So yeah, yeah, really good question there.
All right, folks, anybody who uses server time knows the intricacies of getting multiple machines in multiple places on Earth to sync up. That problem gets real complex when you're launching machines out toward other planets, you know, like Mars and Venus. Uh, we are doing that more now than ever. There are some ways to figure out how to sync up time that way, but we don't really have a standard. So let's take a minute to hear from NTX's Dan Campos about a proposal to standardize time measurement in space. Hello, DTNS crew. Did you know that Chinese scientists published a proposal to create a universal standard for measuring time through the solar system? Measuring time at different locations in space is difficult because of the large distances. A radio signal can take between 3 and 22 minutes to travel from Mars to Earth, and both the relative position and speed is constantly changing. The proposed system would use the Sun as a basis for coordinates to determine the location in space and will mark the beginning of time from the moment in which a signal from a chosen pulsar reaches the Sun. You can check this and more news, including a review about the agreement between President Biden and Obrador about using tech for modernizing the border wall in Noticias de Tecnología Express, the kind of news that can't cross any border. Back to you, amigos. Thank you, Dan. Uh, appreciate that. Now, of course, if you base the standard on the sun, that just means as soon as we leave the solar system, we're going to need a whole new standard. So, you know, you got to think ahead on these yeah. things. I wonder if it's taking into consideration that things traveling fast actually experience time different than your point of reference. You're going to have to. You know, so there's that, a lot yeah. of stuff you got to think about with this. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if anybody, I, and I know there's folks in our audience that work in the aerospace industry, you know, work for NASA and all that sort of thing. I have not seen a lot of folks commenting on this proposal. So I'd be curious uh, if there's any serious discussion about this or if it's just kind of a journal article of, of academic interest only uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Next week is special guest week here on DTNS. New guest that we've never had before to talk about some amazing things. We have Jack Recider from Darknet Diaries on on Monday. Quinn Nelson from Snazzy Labs is coming on. Uh, we expect Will Smith will be on, uh, formerly of Tested. Joel Telling, the 3D printing nerd. Uh, don't miss it. Tell your friends. This is the big thing we need you to do. Get out there and tell folks you can't miss special guest week on Daily Tech News Show. It starts on Monday. Daily Tech News Show. Dot com. All right, let's talk about drones, shall we? Mm, a month after a month after Amazon announced its plans to bring drone deliveries to Lockford, California, it's a little north of Stockton for anybody who's familiar with the area. The company says it'll also offer drone deliveries at Texas A&M in College Station, Texas. Amazon believes it will get FAA approval to begin operations by the end of this year. Amazon's UAVs will be able to carry up to five pounds at up to 50 miles per hour. So pretty zippy, but, you know, five pounds max. So to catch you up, Amazon, which got coverage from 60 Minutes for their drone delivery in December of 2013, now has two announcements for service to begin this year once it gets approval. That is true. But as TechCrunch notes, at least in Texas, Amazon is somewhat late to the game. In March, Israel's Flytex began drone delivery tests in Dallas suburb of Granbury. And Alphabet Swing started service in Frisco and Little Elm, Texas, back in April, where it's been delivering pharmaceuticals and other small packages. Speaking of Wing, the company showed off two prototypes on Thursday that can handle a wider variety of packages. So right now, its drone can carry up to 2.5 pounds and it uses the same drum no matter how small the package is. The largest of the new prototypes would be able to carry up to 7 pounds, increasing the types of deliveries that Wing could do, obviously. But they also showed off a drone able to carry just over half a pound, making it more efficient for little things, prescriptions, etc. Wing says ideally the packages should be around 25% of the mass of the plane or drone. Wing says it has completed more than 250,000 deliveries across Australia, Finland, and the U.S. And meanwhile, for really heavy, excuse me, heavy drone deliveries, the Virgin notes that Elroy Air is working on a drone that can carry up to 500 pounds of cargo with a range of 300 miles. Houston's Bristow Group which mainly does helicopter service for the energy industry and search and rescue has signed a letter of intent to buy 100 of the planes for use in Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, and Arkansas. 
Yeah. So I, I've, I was, uh, for, for the past nine years, I've been kind of hard on Amazon, uh, for, for getting all the attention on that 60 minutes thing and never actually coming to market with a, with a product, uh, for drone delivery. Uh, but I want to give them credit that it does look like they're finally going to have something and they are a retail giant. So once they enter this space for real, it's going to kickstart things. It's going to accelerate things. Uh, and they are expected to get FA approval for all this stuff by the end of the year. And it, it doesn't look like there's any reason why they won't. So with Wing so far down the road and backed by Alphabet, you know, the owners of Google, uh, with all of these other smaller uh, companies like Zipline uh, that are out there with Elroy doing, you know, 500 pounds of cargo, like like full cargo carrying situation a as an alternative that is, that is uh, a drone delivery that is either autonomous or remotely piloted, right? Uh, and that's the thing to remember. A lot of this stuff is remotely piloted. Wing actually has humans. They're not autonomous. Uh, we are going to see this get close to critical mass and it, it, it's either going to stall out, pun intended, uh, or or it's going to take off, also pun intended. And, and I would say if it does take off, by the end of next year, we'll be talking about when are we getting drone delivery in our area versus is drone delivery ever really going to catch on? Yeah, I just you know, have, I have to, a picture in uh, my oh, go mind. Go ahead, Rob. I was just going to say, just a picture of my mind of an Amazon truck pulling into your neighborhood. The top, not the back opens up, the top opens up, and just a bunch uh -huh. of drones just take off and start delivering stuff, you know, to people's door, and then and, and then comes back. I, I don't think we're quite there yet, but. I can kind of see that coming in the future. So the fact that they're actually getting to where they can carry heavier items, it's like it used to be just medicine or very, very small things. Now, maybe if you, I really need that new router. Um, it can be delivered to you relatively quickly. Um, you know, things that are, you know, five pounds, seven pounds that, you know, that seems reasonable, you know, for just most things to get delivered from Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things I, I get a lot of things from Amazon, uh, but you know, not just Amazon, but that's where the majority of my packages come from. And yeah, sometimes they're bundled together in a big old box, but many of the specific items are pretty light, you know, it's yeah, it's vitamins or a shirt or, you know, things that really aren't more than a couple of pounds at most, even with the packaging. What I think is really interesting is Elroy Air saying, okay, you know, we can go, you know, possibly up to 500 pounds of cargo, something for disaster relief, uh, particularly in the areas uh, where the company is kind of looking to at least start servicing somewhat regularly. That's really interesting to me uh, because, you know, when, when you get to the, when you get to that point, okay, yeah, you're not lifting a vehicle necessarily, but you can really move, you can move some stuff. Yeah. And if, and if this, this does, as, as I think is possible, uh, really meet, reach, reach that, uh, takeoff point in the next couple of years, I'm sorry, I just can't think of another way to, 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 to say it. Uh, uh, I, I, I think we're going to go from zero to 60 on safety considerations. Cause up till now, the safety considerations have always been, uh, people talking about how hard the FAA is making it to use drones, right? That they're being over cautious. As soon as these are starting to happen in populated areas, when they start doing this in New York City, uh, when it starts to be more widespread, you're gonna you're gonna see the backlash uh, start to happen because it only takes one or two minor collisions for people to start pointing at that and saying it's unsafe. So they're really gonna have to do a lot to convince people like, no, you're not going to have planes falling out of the sky on top of your head uh, with or quadcopters or anything else. Well, if you're looking for a cool new thing to wear by the pool this summer, Microsoft is launching a new hardware that's hard W E A R. Get Wasn't it? Me that time. It was Clothing collection. <laughs> I know. Couldn't help it. Including a windows XP t-shirt for $60. I didn't name it. Microsoft did. Now you might say $60. That sounds like an expensive t-shirt. And yes, it is. But it's part of a nine piece collection of t-shirts and hats and sweats, jackets and pants. Part of a collab between supervision founder Gavin Mathieu and Microsoft. If you're not familiar, he's uh, big in sort of the style world. It's also Microsoft's first go at selling this kind of clothing merchandise because, you know, merch is hot these days. Director of Multicultural and Social Communications at Microsoft, Amanda O'Neill, explains that, and I love this quote, the collection is reflective of the norm core style, a lifestyle aesthetic that puts the focus on individuals and not on the clothing that they wear. Every piece is intentional and there is meaning behind each item in hardware. 
Uh, there's also a MS Paint t-shirt. You know, if Windows XP doesn't strike your fancy, maybe the MS Paint t-shirt will. And a hardware hat with Microsoft's nine, 1990s logo colorings for a little nostalgia. So what caught my eye in this hardware picture uh, was that uh, it appears that that Gavin with you is wearing uh, a Fear of God hat. Uh, the Fear of God brand is another like streetwear brand from Jerry Lorenzo. Uh, Jerry Lorenzo, by the way, son of former Chicago White Sox manager, Jerry Manuel. Uh, and I looked it up and Gavin and him are friends. They're like, they're like collaborators. They, they, they go way back. So this is definitely tied into the whole streetwear, you know, norm core, like you said, uh, Sarah trend out there. And suddenly I went, I went like on an about face from like, Oh, come on, Microsoft to like, well, at least you did it right. You found somebody who's in the space, knows what they're doing, uh, to put this together. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe it's not I, such a bad idea. <laughs> I have some uh, some friends who are much more into the style, particularly street world wear uh, life than I am. And I sent it to him like, can you believe Microsoft? This is dumb, right? And all of them were like, no, this is really cool. <laughs> yeah, like so the, the it just shows how much I know. Yeah, the folks who are going to be into this are really going to be into this. So, you know, hopefully Microsoft understands that they can't make too much of this stuff. They actually need to have some scarcity there so that everybody sure. can't get it. But um, yeah, I think it actually will probably do pretty well, even though the stuff is a little steep as far as the cost from our standpoint seems to be. It's steep when you think of it as Microsoft swag. Absolutely. Right. It's actually not that bad when you think of it as like branded street. Wear. Branded stuff. Yeah, that's actually. Yeah, it's, it's yeah you want like not. a Supreme t-shirt? It's going to be more than $60. Exactly. Anyway. Right. Yeah. Exactly. We're, we're talking about that. It's it's in that kind of space there. So, uh, and J-Rom 20 points out, uh, the clothes will have end of life with no support. So you want to, you know, make sure you walk in <laughs> extended. Yeah. You spill something on it. That's on you. <laughs> yeah. Have it's you tried you. Uh, cl closing it and opening it again? <laughs> Blowing yeah. it really hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, let's do it. Uh, this one comes from Mark. Mark writes, on Wednesday's show, you were talking about the new peak of electrical demand when the smart thermostats are warming up homes while people are waking up. The frustrating thing about smart thermostats is that they rely entirely on the furnace and air conditioner to manage temperature, and they leave other options off the table. For example... You discussed a Finnish company called Polar Light a short while ago that created a thermal battery made from sand. The idea to generate electricity, but why not repurpose the solution to store heat during the day and then release it during the morning warm up? For decades, commercial buildings have run chillers at night and used the stored ice to cool during peak electrical hours. Couldn't we do something similar with residential cooling? but on a smaller scale. Mark says, finally, smart thermostats rarely take into account the outside temps. At some point, the outside temperature might be lower than the inside temperature, might be cheaper to exhaust the hot air than bring in fresh, cooler air. Some might think this would be a big change to the way that we heat and cool homes. But Mark says, I think that solar has already done that. And some of these ideas may be less expensive than installing panels on our roofs. All right. Uh, the one thing I do know is that the Finnish company doing the sand is doing the same thing that you're talking about. You can generate electricity from it, but they are using it for heating. Uh, so they, they may be doing exactly what you're talking about, Mark. The rest of this, I don't know enough about the space to know if Mark is a genius <laughs> uh, or if there are good reasons why this doesn't happen. Or maybe it's happening and we're just not aware of it. Uh, but the, these all sound worthwhile to me. I, I they think they sound like great tweaks that and, and the idea of a smart thermostat doing more than just trying to set the temperature at an optimal time is is a good one to pursue. Like what else could the smart thermostat be smart about? That's a great question. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff from Mark and everybody who uh, has uh, great questions, uh, great uh, anecdotes for stories that we've talked about, ideas for future stories. Do send them our way. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. And Jerry Ron like 20 has clarified, if you have a problem with your Microsoft hardware, you just take it off and put it back on again. It'll be fine. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Huh. It is easy. <laughs> uh, well, something we're never going to take off our show is Rob Dunwood, uh, because you're such a delight, Rob. Good to see you again today. Let folks know what you've been up to lately. It is always a pleasure being on DTNS. And I am can be found at basically everything at Rob Dunwood. And also come check out one of my other shows, The Tech John, which is a weekly tech show 
where uh, we talk about tech from a bit of a different perspective. You know, all the hosts look like me and uh, we bring some social commentary into how technology affects our daily lives. I mean, I don't know if Stephanie and you are like twins or anything, but I, I know what you're saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, you know, I, 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 I love your album art. I mean, I, I love the show also, but I really love the album art. It's good stuff. Mr. Lynn Peralta. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, and an essential, man. essential listen for me every week. I'm not even joking. Like it, it, you guys, if you're talking about something we've already talked about on DTNS, we'll bring in a bunch of stuff that I didn't think about before, or you're covering a, a story that we didn't get to or, or didn't know about. So it's, it's a perfect compliment to your other technology uh, information, folks, the techjohn.com. We also have a brand new boss to thank. We said yesterday we we're going to make a big deal out of it, and we sure are. Sebastian is our new gold star winner. Just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Sebastian. Glad to have you on board. Mm, I said we we're going to make a big deal. There we go. Sebastian. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Look at you. Sebastian, Sebastian yeah. did it. Look, we weren't sure anybody could fill in the shoes from yesterday, but Sebastian proved us wrong. So I don't mm-hmm. know. Could it happen on Monday? No I idea. think so. No idea. I, th- I think we're capable of it. So, yeah, if you're not a patron uh, thinking about it, uh, now's the time. Um, we thank you in advance. Reminder, there's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet, also available at patreon.com slash DTNS, which we roll into right after DTNS wraps up. But just a reminder, DTNS is live. We do it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. So every weekday, find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back Monday. It kicks off special guest week with Jack Recider from Darknet Diaries. So excited. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Strathalino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Gadget Virtuoso, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show included Nika Monford, Ayaz Akhtar, Scott Johnson, Lamar Wilson, and Rob Dunwood. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>